All right, you guys ready to get started? Everyone ready? All right. Well, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Pastor Brett. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Rock Harbor Church. I, uh, I do the youth, the young adults, and some pastoral counseling and a little bit of everything around here. But before I came to this church, or before I became full-time into ministry here, I had a small-scale farm. And basically what we were doing was we were growing um, all sorts of vegetables, and we were selling to farmer's markets originally is how we started. So I kind of did it on the side, started really small, um, started in my father-in-law's backyard, actually, just kind of growing some stuff, messing around, started really off with a lot of lettuce and microgreens, which I'll talk about later on what that is. And then we went and moved to about 5,000 square feet space. And you can kind of see on the picture here, this wasn't, this was the last farm that we had, but with the method that we follow, we're maximizing every square inch possible that we can. So we're, um, and I'll get into that more. But then we moved up to another place and that's kind of the picture there. And then actually that hill back there, we actually ended up flattening it out and going out that way as well. Um, and then what we did as well, so we started with the farmer's market, then we were able to get it kind of full time and we did a subscription plan where people would sign up for about 10 weeks and we would deliver to their house every Friday. So we'd pack everything up every Friday, harvest. And then what we ended up doing is opening an online store as well, where people that weren't on our subscription plan could also go on and just buy like carrots, this or whatever, they, what other vegetables they wanted. So that's kind of how that all started. And then, I mean, during this whole time, I, you know, obviously felt called to go into ministry for quite a while. And I was mentoring under Pastor Brandon for a couple of years and taking some seminary classes and it's kind of weird, funny, not, well, I guess funny, amazing how God works is how it all worked out. You know, the, that door kind of shut and this door opened and here I am now. And then it's kind of funny that I'm being able to get to talk about farming all again. So I guess, I guess I did it for a reason. So, uh, and here it is. So, so with that, I would just say before we jump in is, I mean, farming, all this stuff's under attack, right? I mean, they're, they're going after all they're going after now people, other farms and other countries and everything else. And I was talking to someone and they said now they're even coming after community gardens. They want the FDA's wanting them to uh, register. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Don't know why they wanna know all that. <laughs> exactly. And the other thing that's a huge thing when you think about what's the best way to, I mean, out of all the thing, what's the best way to control population? Exactly. I mean, everyone has to eat, right? Everyone has to, everyone has to eat. So that's the biggest one is, so if you want to control population, control the, the, the farming, control the food. And we already see Bill Gates buying, uh, he's one of, I think the largest landowner, um, China's buying up land. All these people are buying up land. It's quite interesting. So with that being said, it's probably a good idea for us to learn how to grow some of our own food and be able to rely on ourselves. Now, it's smart to, to prepare, obviously, but ultimately, and maybe at the end, I'll talk about that. We're gonna have to spiritually prepare. We can prepare physically like we're doing here. This is smart, right? It's wise, wise counsel, good idea to, hey, buy some food. Maybe I should start growing some of my own food. Um, there could, you know, we're seeing food shortages. We've seen it before with the whole COVID thing and all that. That's all, that's all good. But ultimately it's gonna come down to really leaning and trusting on God for his provision and all that. But all that spiel kind of being said, let's go ahead and jump into the first thing. So starting a plot. Now, I guess I'll ask real quick, how many people here are kind of looking, how many people actually have enough land where maybe they can do a lot? And how many people are just looking maybe to grow in like some raised beds and some different stuff? What about like raised beds? Or, okay. And how many are interested in like maybe actually their backyard or they have a decent amount of space where maybe they can put in some, you know, kind of, you know, not like doesn't have to be, like that, but like the first, the first picture maybe where you have some room not to do like all that, to make, but maybe to put in some beds and different things like that. Maybe you wanna grow into a little bit bigger scale. Is anyone interested in that? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna try to cater around to all that. Um, obviously my focus, what I did was kind of on a little bit of a bigger scale, obviously not like conventional farming, but starting a plot will be the first thing. So 
And we'll add that in with, if you're gonna do raised beds or something like that, it'd be a little different. You would wanna build raised beds, you wanna get compost, and we'll talk some about that when we get to it. But let's say you just have some, some land, I don't know, air in your backyard, maybe you're, you're on an acre or two, something like that. The first step is gonna be, what I would do, is I would rototill once, and then I'm gonna talk about what I did after that. I would never actually rototill ever again. I would do a thing called no-till that I'll get into in just a little bit. So I'd rotate, rotate, or rototill, thank you, rototill the place once. And then eventually, so that was our first plot, uh, our, our plot at the last place we were at. And that was the first section. And then we ended up flattening that hill out and going all the way that direction as well. And so that was our first step is what I would do is that. So now you, you got the ground broken up, it's ready, it's loose. And so the next thing that you can do, you can do a couple options. You can just get started right into it, or a smart idea and a lot, uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll tarp it. And what they're tarping it for is they'll tarp the ground that they rototill. Now you've got everything up, right? So all those seeds of the weeds and everything else are all rototilled up. Then you tarp it because all that's gonna wanna sprout up. So those weeds will all sprout up. And then when you leave it tarp for a couple, you know, a month or two, depending summer, it's probably won't be as long because it's obviously so hot. And anything that's gonna sprout is gonna die, basically. They're not gonna be able to go. They'll have no sunlight, nothing. So that's kind of, they give you a head start because weeds are gonna be your biggest thing. And there's nothing, if they're wanting to go the organic route that we were, I mean, it's your weed control is a hula ho, you know? So I mean, there's not any other, really a lot of good options as far as that is organically. So that's kind of the next step. Then finally, what you wanna do is you wanna start lining out your plot. So this is what I'll start talking about. And you guys can make, if you guys are making raised beds, obviously be different. We'll get into the compost in a minute. But if you're gonna start on the ground like this, what I would do, no matter how long you're gonna make it, but what my beds were all, this is what I would call, this is what I call beds. That's what I'm, if you hear me call that, those are gonna be beds, all those little things. That's what I would call a bed. That's what I'm gonna call them so everyone kind of get the lingo here. So, what I would do is all my beds were 30 inches wide, no matter what, they're all 30 inches wide. And there's a big reason for it. And the big reason is I can stand perfectly over it and I have room, it's a good, it's a good width, everything, and I can get down and I can work um, and plant and everything. So I would highly recommend whatever you guys do and however long you make them is do that. Now the standard in the small scale farming and that, the models that I was following, the standards on length are gonna be 50 foot, or 100 foot, obviously you guys don't have to go that long thing on the room. I mean, if you have 15 feet, uh, 25 feet, whatever, you can do that. But all my beds were 30 inches wide and they were either 50 foot long or 100 foot long. Um, and the reason that you stay in that 50 to 100 foot, we, I did was everything's kind of tailored towards that in that small farming community, like row covers and all that stuff are kind of tailored to that. But it's not a big deal. You can make them shorter if you don't have the room, that's fine. So. How I would do this now when I would start off is I would just go wherever, to Home Depot, you get those little wood blocks and I would just cut a piece of wood. What I would do is cut it 30 inches long and it's tough, you know, it's a lot of, you can eyeball. If you, I mean, if you had a laser or something, that would be probably sweet and easy to make it really straight. But what I would do is I would start, I'd put that on the ground. I know it's 30 inches wide and then I'd get my two little posts and I'd stick them next and I would hammer them in, so I have my line. Then I would go do that on the other side, and then you can grab string, and I would string them. And so you can kind of see the string there on that one. Now, the next thing that I did to maximize all the space I had is I would not make big walkways. So you're looking to anywhere from six to, depending, six inches to a foot walkways. I think these were 10 or 10 inches or about a foot um, walkways. And the reason is that is you're just trying to maximize every space you have. You don't want to eat it up with a bunch of walkways. So you want to maximize as much space that you can get in. So that's the reason that we did that. So then what I would do is you would measure 12 foot and you'd put your next stake or whatever it's going to be, whatever your walkway is. And then you continue that process of stringing them and you can kind of line out all your beds. And so that's kind of your next step. So, you know, you get the plot going, get that. Then now we're lining out all our beds. And then... What you can do too is what works really good too with the walkways is just getting a flathead um, shovel and just walking in between. It's about the right size, you know, for your walkway, it's a decent size and just push that through and kind of make that 
um, just push that dirt and kind of make that walkway so you can start getting it and uh, kind of walking on it. And because I mean that part, you you know, it's fine if it's compacted or whatever because you're trying to stop as much weeds as you can. But um, so the next step after that, what I would do. So you guys remember I said I wrote it till once. This is the next thing that I would do when I would start um, my plots or not even just starting. This is what I would do every time I was starting a new bed, every time I was planting a new bed. So instead of going in and rototilling the bed up, so we rototiller it once, but now we don't wanna do that again. And the reason why is it's keeping all the organic matter and everything intact because you're never flipping it over again or anything. Because soil is gonna be the biggest thing for all you guys. Soil, compost, if you don't have good soil, if you don't have good compost, then you're not gonna grow good vegetable. You're not gonna be able to grow. So that's the most important key is really, is it's all about your soil. So the reason, so what this does is you go, and there's two ways. They make broad forks, which is nice because they're about close to the width of the size of the 30 inch bed. Again, that's kind of why I would recommend doing that as well. You can do that, or you can even do just like kind of that pitchfork thing. And, and that guy right there, I'll talk about him later on, but he's a great guy to follow. And I'll show a list of farms to follow at the end. I'll give you guys a list of good resources at the end for material, everything. But he was a great guy. What this guy did, he's up in Canada and he would actually farm backyards when he first started off. So he was farming a quarter of an acre and he was doing high um, profitable crops like greens and some root vegetables. And he was selling to restaurants and all that. And I used to do a little bit of restaurants too, but um, then he would do the same thing I was doing. It's, it's called a CSA that is a co community supported agriculture where we have that subscription plan. And this guy was, I think, I if you look into it, it's amazing. He breaks it all down. He was doing $100,000 a year off a quarter acre of growing vegetables. And anyways, he, he maximizes space and everything else, but kind of getting off track there, but I'll talk about him more later. Back to the, the broad fork though. So what you do there, instead of flipping the soil and rototilling it all again, you wanna just leave it. You wanna let all that organic matter, all the compost you put in over time is gonna be building up. So what this is doing is, is it's still allowing airflow and everything. So you, you're putting it in the ground, you're pushing down, um, and you're pulling back to that. You go to the next and you just walk backwards down your bed doing that the whole way. Um, then after you do that, the next thing um, that you would do is, that would be awesome if, if you had is, I, I forgot to get a picture on here, is I had a thing called a tilther. And what the tilther did, it was ran off a, uh, a drill actually. And it's kind of like a rototiller, but what it was doing was only f hitting the first two inches of the soil. And it was just fluffing it up so it's easier to plant, but it wasn't digging into the deeper part. Um, but other things you can do is, and then you would kind of rake it and stuff. But um, your next step would be though, after you do this, is you wanna put down your compost. And basically what I would do is I get a wheel, wheelbarrow, I would throw it in the wheelbarrow and then I would make those little piles. And then that's my wife there. And then we would just go and rake it and spread it out. Now, this is the most important part is getting good compost. Soil, again, it's gonna be huge. I would probably, I would recommend staying away from, you don't have to, but you wanna make sure it's cured and it's good. I would probably stay away. This was all kind of green waste and stuff. I would probably stay more away from manures I did go with a manure product one time that was manure-based compost, and, it, and I bought a whole truckload of it. They bring it, and it was still hot. It wasn't cured. I put it down, and I killed thousands of plants because of it. It was too hot, it's too much, it wasn't cured. So I would find good quality or organic soil that's um, green waste, you know, would be the best, or, you know, vegetables and, um, all that kind of stuff. And um, you can call around, there's different places here and things, but that, what you wanna do when you're starting and putting on, especially in the very beginning, you wanna put on probably a two to four inch layer of, uh, of compost on the top and just lay that down and rake it. Then what I would do after that is I would just, and then I would plant straight into it. I would just, then I would, I will get into planting here in a minute, but then I would just plant straight into that. Um, but com again, guys, the soil is the key. Um, 
There's a lot of research, there's a lot of things you can get into. So that's something if you guys are interested is maybe really studying up on that. What's the best, what's to get? Now, I guess I know some of you guys are doing um, raised beds. So with the raised beds, I guess I would go down to, the kind of the cool thing about raised beds is I guess you don't have to worry about weeds as much. You can load that baby up with compost and all sorts of stuff. So, um, and another thing, it might be good, and I'll talk about it more when I do my transplants, is when you're doing that is to, you know, get, a, get soil bags, get compost, and maybe get some like, you can mix in like some peat moss or cocoa core and things like that. That'll help retain the water better. Um, and things, so, uh, and I'm sorry, I've never really done the raised bed, so I'm ho- but I think you can kind of use these principles. So I hope this is helpful for you guys that are doing kind of raised beds and things like that. But um, now uh, we'll get into so watering and sprinklers. So I, everything I did, guys, when I was farming was trial and error. All I mean, I learned what not to do a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot. Um, every year I learned I won't do that again next year. Um, and that never stopped. It was every single year, I won't do that again next year. I will do this again next year. So it was just a constant thing. So I'm sure that you guys garden, you guys, some of you guys already do or have that you already know this or you're always figuring new stuff out or that didn't work or this works. Now, with irrigation, I tried a, a lot of different stuff. The way that I was doing it, I mostly stayed with overhead watering. And the reason that I did that was because I was constantly churning over beds, just meaning like I was just churning and burning. I had a bed planted, and then as soon as it was time to harvest, harvest, and I needed to get something else in it. Um, to, again, that's how we were making our living. So, I mean, we were literally planting and harvesting every single week. And it's because as far as like a conventional farm, you know, where you plant and you wait, you know, months, and then you go harvest. We were continuing. So we had everything from seeds into the, in our nursery that were little seedlings all the way to the finished product and all the stages in between. So we were constantly having to turn over. So the bad thing for that, for me with um, running drip lines was I was constantly going to have to move them out of the way to, re, to replant and reset that bed up. So I stayed with overhead a lot. Now I tried a lot of different I tried a few different sprinklers. The best sprinkler I found is the one right there. It's called a wobbler. So you can write that down, look, look up wobblers. And what's cool about the wobblers is you can get, it'll come with any size droplets you want, bigger droplets and all that. The wobbler, what it does is it spins 360 degrees really fast and it shoots up the water and then just, it hits the top and it's just shooting out. And it's really good for wind drift and all that. And that was probably, that was, was the best sprinklers I found and what all the small farms um, and things that I was following were using. Now with drip line, what I would do with drip line and is if you maybe you had to raise beds or what I would, what I would really think is the best is to have high, a hybrid system where you had overhead and drip because what's great about overhead in the beginning is let's say you're direct seeding, the, the overhead's getting that soil nice and wet and to help grow everything out. But then it would be nice to kind of, you could just switch to drip once maybe the plants were up. When I, where, where I would use drip line, this is what I would do was, if we grew strawberries or your longer term crops, um, so like Swiss chard um, would be another one. Like Swiss chard, it was, and I'll get into those things of like longer term crops that you're gonna be able to get a lot off of. And then um, they would call them cut and come again, things like arugula and spinach where you could cut and come back in two weeks, cut again. But, um, but like your longer term crops, like let's say your broccoli, um, Swiss chard, like strawberries, different things like that. What I would actually recommend on those ones is laying down um, landscape fabric even over the bed. And then I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. Have you ever seen those flame weeders? where they connect, it's just a circle kind of at the end, it connects to a propane tank and it just goes like that. What was nice about those, what you could do is you could line out, let's say on this bed right here, I lined out landscape fabric down the whole thing. I marked holes of where I was gonna plant, let's say strawberries or something, uh, whatever my spacing was, I'd mark them all out. Then you could turn that thing on and just get it hot enough and you could burn circles into it. And then you could plant straight into the soil right there what you would do is then put your drip line first, then lay it over that, and then you could mark, um, or have the holes done, and then put your drip line in. But then what you could do is come in and poke your holes for your drip line exactly where you want them through those circles. 
and then they would be getting watered and everything else, and then that's stopping all the weeds, and the only thing that's coming up is your, your plant. So on longer term crops, that's a great option to do. Um, on things like arugula and stuff, you won't be able to do that because what arugula would do is, like, let, this might have been arugula here. I mean, it hasn't sprouted up, but you could kind of see this 30 inch bed right here. What I would do is on arugula, I would, and baby kale and all those are going to be direct seeded. There's probably one, two, three, four, five, probably six or seven rows of arugula plants. And what would happen then, that, that would basically turn into a whole like grass bed eventually. It just looks like all the way across. So it wouldn't work on things like that. But on your broccolis, your Swiss chard, things like that, you could put landscape fabric, put the drip line underneath. I did that with strawberries and it worked out great for controlling weeds and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's another option. And it, so again, if you if you have the option to do both, I mean, that's always, I know some farms that would do hybrid systems and they would run overheads and drip depending on, because it all depends on what, we were growing so much stuff, it depends on what you're growing. Some stuff it's like, okay, this works good on drip, this works good on overhead. So it's kind of cool if you can have both. Um, all right, so let's get into some planting. And I'll just say this too, over this, I know I'm just giving kind of a large overview and it's probably gonna be like, feel like a lot of info. At the end, like I said, I will give you other farms that will actually go into like, if you're like, I wanna, I wanna know how to plant radishes, or I wanna know how to do this, or I wanna know how to harvest. I'll show you guys some farms to follow that will go just in that. Cause honestly, we could do a, each segment we've talked on, we could do a talk on its own the whole, the whole time. So I, I'm sorry if it sounds like a, lo a lot, um, like a kind of drinking out of a fire hose, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it'll, it'll be able to grab some tips from it. So let's talk, we're gonna talk about direct seeding first. So direct seeding, like I said, I would direct seed things like arugula, um, uh, baby kale, um, radishes, turnips, things like that would, I would wanna direct seed into the ground. And so there's a few different methods to do it. When I first started, I didn't have, these, these are seeders basically that you just push. They cut a trench and they're dropping seed down and burying it back behind you. R really cool. This is a, called the Jang Cedar. And that's like the top of the line, like best one you can get. It was amazing. It has different wheels in it for different seeds you wanna use. It, you can time out your spacing. It does, it's, it was amazing. That's the one I had. That was my first one I had and that thing would kind of crunch seeds up sometimes, but that, the, J, the Jang Cedar was an awesome cedar if you guys were ever looking into getting to that. Now, when I first started, I started with none of these cool tools. It was all, I bootstrapped the whole entire farm. So it was all just as it came. Um, so let's say direct seeding and you don't have a cedar, right? Now, obviously it's easy to Maybe if you're planting something, direct seeding something where you're just poking a hole here and there and just dropping a seed. But let's say you're planting arugula or baby kale. You're gonna to wanna to drop a, a lot of seeds down the thing. Cause what arugula and baby kale will do is like I said earlier, it'll all grow up and eventually look like, like a luscious bed of just perfectly all the way across. And you can come in and, and harvest all of it. And so on a 30 inch, on a 30 inch bed like this, on arugula, baby kale, things like that, I were putting, you could see this line right here, I was putting in anywhere from six to nine rows of arugula or baby kale in, in that little 30 inch, or that 30 inch bed there. So if you don't have a cedar, let's go back to that. So some options, obviously you're doing raised beds, what I would do is, I would use whatever, I'd use my hand, the side of something and just cut little, cut little trenches into it basically. And I would come in and just, and I would sprinkle my seed and cover it cover it back up that I was gonna grow like, you know, a couple rows of uh, arugula or spinach or something or baby kale or something like that. But let's say you have a little bit bigger thing and you're like, man, I don't wanna, that's a long way to do. What you can do is take the side of a hoe or um, sorry, or a hula hoe or something like that. Take the kind of angle it and you could just walk and just cut little trenches in all the way down. Or what they have is that take like a landscape rake and they make little things where you can actually space them and uh, like little rubber things that go over it that are gonna kind of dig into the ground a little bit and push the rake up. So say let's say you make like six rows on that and you just go and you just drag that whole thing down and then you would come back and whatever you gotta do it. And it's fine with like arugula and things, you can just go in there and just 
start sprinkling in that thing and then covering it up. Um, so that's kind of the different things for direct seating. Um, but the man, that, that cedar thing was, it was awesome. He just, you know, just walked down and it's like, the, the time saving when you get into some of these tools was amazing. Like I'll show you guys a, a, a paper pot transplanter that I used to use and it helped me. It went from two hours to plant a bed to um, like 10 minutes. So it was, these things were huge helps. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else with direct seating. Um, so again, most of my direct seating, I was mostly doing, um, I wouldn't direct seed. I'll get into it later of that, but I wouldn't direct seed like my lettuces. I wouldn't direct seed um, things like that. Uh, what I would direct seed would be, again, I would direct seed arugula. I would direct seed um, kale. I would mess with doing two things with spinach. I would try out direct seeding and transplanting. I would mess around with both of them. Both are, can work out fine. And then um, your turnips, um, your carrots would be direct seeded. Uh, your green onions, you could do both. Uh, I would probably direct seed. Um, I did some, pur I used to do purple. I never really did big onions, but I used to do the little purple onions, the little smaller ones. I used to transplant those ones. So kind of just depending, and um, yeah, yeah. Not, so my, yeah. So my decision process was trial and error, but let's just say like arugula. I would never transplant arugula because it's just too, you wanna plant so much and I wanted to plant so many beds because you wanna get it to where it grows, grows up, like I said, and it's just all the way across, it's connected. Like that 30 inch bed right here will just be all uh, just green. That's all you'll see is just straight arugula. And so something like that would be way too hard to transplant because you would, I mean, the easiest thing would be to just drop seed, 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 seed like, cause you want it to just sprout up like, like crazy in that line. So that's why I would never, like that, I would never try to transplant that. Other things, it was a lot of, Lettuce and different things, I just didn't have as good, it was easier for me on like lettuce, Swiss chard, those things to transplant them and start them in cell trays that I'll show you guys. Um, so I guess it's really was a lot of trial and error of what works, what doesn't work, what makes sense. Um, and my lettuce, my lettuce was like a, our staple crop. I mean, we, we grew a lot of lettuce and I'll talk about a little bit of what type of lettuce to get. and. What was nice about it was all of our stuff, guys, like our lettuce bags would hold up two, three weeks before they even started to get slimy. Yeah. And that was, I know, they used, Denise and Mike. Thank you. Denise and Mike, I used to deliver to them uh, every week. So, um, and that, that was the amazing part of it. Um, that's the amazing part I think about growing your, your own food is you find out that, it's, you know, it tastes better, it lasts longer, there's more flavor to it, all these things, right? And you know exactly what went into it and what's happening with it. So anyways, kind of, so it was a lot of trial and error, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, so the next, the other thing that I wanted to cover real quick as we get into transplanting is I would recommend like, and you don't have to have something like this, but having like a greenhouse. So with this greenhouse, what I did was this little greenhouse that we had. This was just, we had like a, this wasn't at the farm, this is at our house. And the reason I did that is so I could basically plant all there and baby those, be able to baby the little ones and get them to go to make sure they would survive so I could take them to the farm. And so we'd keep them at our house. So all I did guys to make, this is called a, the, a hoof house. And there's obviously bigger ones. I made it as a nursery. And what I would do is during the winter, I would put like four mil, plastic that you could get at Home Depot over it. And then during the summer, I would put 50% shea cloth over it because I was had a lot, mostly a lot of lettuce and greens or that type of stuff in there that it was obviously too hot, which I'll talk about later on of how to grow. I'll teach you guys how to grow lettuce in the, in the summertime. Um, and so all that was guys is that's PVC pipe. It's like two 10 foot sticks, I think that I just, and then glued together. I had one going down the center with Tees, and I just plugged them in together. I had rebar in the ground that I slid them in, and that's all I, I mean, 
and I lay down landscape fabric. Like I said, I was finding simple, easy things because I didn't have, you know, I bootstrapped everything. I didn't have a bunch of money to go out and spend because, I mean, you can get um, big old things that are bent and that will, the metal's all bent to it and big old hoop houses and all sorts of cool stuff. But I mean, having like a little nursery is a good thing for your, tra- for your transplants, having a little area. It doesn't have to be something like this. I mean, it can be, whatever. I mean, maybe it's just a table out in the, back, in the backyard or something. I mean, that's, it, you know, totally fine. I just wanted to throw that kind of in there to show you guys maybe something easy. Maybe you could do a little DIY project. Um, so the next thing is, this is what we would plant our... Uh, head lettuce in, or anything we were gonna transplant basically in. And so what these are called, these are cell trays. And when we would transplant, my wife would do a lot of the transpl- or uh, the planting at the home. And what uh, we would do is, what we found would work really good was you can take a little bit of soil, but also we would put um, cocoa core. And what's cool about cocoa core, we do a lot of cocoa core. You can buy like a big old, you just buy like a big old brick of it and you literally put it in a bucket and fill it with water and it just starts expanding. And all it is is spun, like a bunch of spun cocoa or, um, from the co- or from coconut or whatever. So, and it holds water, it holds water good. And so we use that a lot in our, in our um, as we were gonna transplant. So what we would do is we would just go in, we'd fill this all with soil make little, little dents, get it compacted in there good, make little dents, and we would start dropping our are seed. Saying, are you saying cocoa core? Yes. Core? Yeah, core, yeah, cocoa core, yeah. Or I'm not sure how. Yeah, sure. I'm not. <laughs> I just know cocoa core. I don't know how to spell it. Okay. <laughs> what, do I look like an English teacher? Uh, but <laughs> No, but, um, sorry, Dan, I'm just messing with you. But, um, so anyways, I would put, um, you know, s- some cocoa, whatever in that, make little divots, and then you would plant your, your seed in there, right? So whatever you were gonna plant in there, um, drop them all in, then come back and cover it up again, water, water it in nicely, and then obviously wait for it to start germinating, growing. And then once we get to the farm, you know, we'd look at something like this. They're starting to get close to being ready. And then we would go out to the farm and then obviously that's how they would look. And those plugs, for the most part, if you, if you get them good, and I think that's why it was kind of nice about the cocoa tour. If you get it nice and good and compact, they should slide right out. Sometimes they have holes in the bottom that you can maybe poke a little something in to get them to pull out. Sometimes they don't always come out good, they only half of it. But as long as, you know, they have like a decent, like you see some roots and different things in there, it'll, it'll be, it'll be, uh, should, should be fine. Um, and I would, there were some trays that it would just be pop out like amazingly and some break off and all that. But, um, so that's kind of how we would start them. Then we would put them in the nursery. Then we were watering them every day. Yeah, um, I'm gonna do in just a minute, I'll get to more uh, pest control, but I think with, um, I think maybe being, that's, I'm gonna say that sometimes, it's not always good. Being in town can help compared to like being, which our farm was out in the country, but there's usually more bugs out by all the farms and things. But honestly, what we would, what I would do, so I'll get into it in a minute, into pest control and I'll totally answer your question. But what we would do is, um, during your biggest issues, your biggest pests, and I'll get into it, are going to be aphids and uh, prob- and um, no, um, oh my goodness, uh, keep going. The, the things that turn into moths. Why can I think? Caterpillars. Thank you. I don't know why that word blinked. I just blinked on that word. Uh, caterpillars. Those were really the only issues I had with a lot of my seedlings at my house. And I'll show you in just a little bit how I controlled them. Um, and just a, in just a sec, we'll get to that and uh, the pest con- on uh, managing pests. So once I would grow them, once they would get to this part, again, that's why I said 30 inch wide beds. I would get out to the farm. I would take that little tray next to me. And let's say if they're planting lettuce heads, uh, I could, I would probably, I was doing, um, 
about three to four rows of lettuce heads. Now, if I was doing Salvanova that I'll talk about in a little bit, lettuce, that lettuce I would do differently. And it was my, it was really cool lettuce. I'll talk about it more in a little bit, but these are heads. And that was more of my mix bags for my cut up, my uh, like kind of like a spring mix type thing. But my head lettuce, um, basically what I would do is I would take that with me I would, a lot of times I would mark out my bed of how I wanted to space them. And I'm sorry, guys, it's been a while. I'm trying to remember what I used to space my lettuce at. Um, I would do like three rows and I would go like six or eight inches or something of going down. So I'd poke all my, uh, mark, kind of mark all my holes. You can poke them. And then again, that was nice about standing over the bed. You would be able to stand over that bed and you would just drag. And you can get a, you can get, um, a little shovel or whatever. Honestly, what I do a lot, I was able to get it down where you're going quick enough where I would just poke my fingers and pull it back, set it over and just, and I mean, you start doing it a lot. You start getting, it becomes really easy. You start getting better and better at it. Um, now, this is what I was talking about, my paper pot transplanter. So those were the cell trays that I was showing you and that's the hand transplanting. Now, head lettuce, I would still, I used to still hand transplant, but these were, um, these were green beans right here. This, this tool was so cool, was amazing. Um, and basically, let me see that some more pictures so I can kind of show you. So there's one kind of picture of it, another angles, you can kind of see it. So basically when we, at our house, this thing would come flat like this and then you, Pull it, you would open it like an accordion basically and you would set it down in the thing and then you would fill it with soil and then all that is is um, like paper. That's all it is, it's like cardboard kind of material and you would plant all your, I'd put all my soil in just like we talked earlier with the cell trays and I would plant uh, like green beans. My, this is uh, salvanova lettuce that I'll talk about in a little bit. All that stuff I would plant in that and what was amazing about this tool was then when it was time to go out to, to plant is, and right here you could see it, that would be right up, this little piece would be right up here and you would go in and shove it and that would kind of put it up and you would unravel the first one and they're all connected. You would unravel it down. I take like a little screwdriver or something, shove it into the ground. And then this thing underneath, let's see if I have any picture. Oh, I should have put more. Under, Underneath here, it's cutting a trench. And then you would just pull that thing down and the, the chain would just come out. And then those wheels were burying that trench back up behind it. It was a, this thing was amazing. This thing, so this was called the paper pot transplanter and you can get it at paper pot co. I'll talk, um, I'll have a list of all that stuff at the end. Now, if you're on, if you're wanting to get into like bigger scale, um, or maybe you're kind of interested in maybe growing for more people or doing some little small little little farm or you know growing, maybe taking some stuff to the market. I don't know, whatever. This tool is amazing. This would save your back and your time like no other. So I just kind of wanted to show it was a really, it was a great tool. Um, but anyways, if you're doing raised beds or something like that, that's probably not going to be bad because you're just going to go over and. And that's gonna be well, the nice about raised beds, you fill it up with a bunch of good compost and all that. It's gonna be soft and you should have no problem just um, transplanting right in. Um, so that's a, that was a great tool. And I'm sorry that just time, time wise, I can't get into every single thing of, um, you know, like how do you plant this? How do you plant that? But I hope that, again, I hope that this is just some good tips and different things to take and I'll set you guys in the right direction to get more info so you guys can dive in deeper. Now, growing in winter and summer, that was the hardest things, right? How do I grow? I learned how to grow stuff that's not supposed to grow in the summer. Now, summer vegetables, there's no way around it. Summer vegetables, all you're gonna be able to do is grow it in the summer, like your squashes, your tomatoes, your zucchinis, all those things, those are you know more warmer temperature, different things. You're not gonna be able to grow it in the, in the winter time. But, what I was able to do is grow, I was growing lettuce year round. I was growing radishes year round. I was growing turnips year round, Swiss chard, green onion, um, carrots, and on and on and on. The only thing I wasn't growing year round was, was summer crops. Um, so 
Let's start with summer first. This is how I learned. I learned this from a farm in Arizona that uh, was the kind of the same model as us. And what they would do is they put shade cloth over. It's 50% shade cloth. And what you do is you will, you have your normal water times, but add a couple bursts, like one to two minute bursts throughout the day, just two or three. And with that 50% shade cloth and those bursts of water, you're kind of making like a microclimate and tricking that lettuce that it's not a hundred degrees outside. And it's not, you know what, and our, your yields might not be always the best and it is tough and it, a different thing, but you, you can do it. And especially in the beginning of summer, it's not too, when it starts getting like super hot, it's, it is tough. I'll admit with the lettuce is wise. And I'll, um, but so how I would do this guys, which was really cool. All this is, is you know, like the gauge wire that goes along the bottom of a chain link fence, just comes in a big old circle. I would go down to Home Depot and just buy a big old thing of it. And uh, I would kind of get the first one, kind of line it up of how deep I wanted in the ground. This is them right here. And I would cut it and then I would just start cutting them. And then, so what I would do is on your ends, you make that um, kind of a cross. You have one going this way and one going that way on both ends of the bed. So on this end and that. Now, the next ones are just, just placed in single hoops, however you kind of think you need. I think I would do on my 50 foot beds, there was like probably, I don't know, seven or eight of those little ho of those hoops. And I would throw them down. Now, the reason I would do this on the end is you would start from one end, get your shade cloth. And I used to buy this little clips and you can use sandbag. You can see, I used to throw some sandbags here and there too on there, but I used to buy little clips um, and I would clip the one side, clip the two, clip one there, clip one there, and clip one there. Then I would go over, and the reason that you do those on the end is you're able to stretch it better. It makes it a little more sturdier, and you can push that other side down and get it nice and tight. And then you can throw sandbags or go and every so often chuck some of those little clips on the other little things. And so this is how I was growing. Like this was summertime, and this, you know, that's how we were growing lettuce and things in the summer. So I would cover lettuce, I would cover spinach. The only one that you're gonna find that's gonna be really tough to do in summer is arugula. And it's cause it's gonna wanna bolt on you, meaning it's gonna wanna go to seed really quick on you. You're not gonna get the cuttings you did, but it's usually not for long. I, I probably only didn't have arugula for a month or two. Um, kale. Baby kale, big kale, all that, that, that thing's hardy, man. That's a hardy, tough to kill plant. Like it would, it would do good. Um, you could throw shade cloth over it. Sometimes it would survive other. Um, I think right next to that, I had some, those were right there were mustard greens. I would probably cover them up. So, I mean, I was growing all sorts of stuff. That's, um, I think that's dill right there that we had going and stuff. Um, so summertime. That's what I recommend, getting 50% shade cloth, 40 to 50% shade cloth and misting throughout the day and basically tricking those greens that it's you know not 100 degrees outside. Now, summer, summer and, and kind of spring, warmer times, everything grows quicker. So like your, your radish, radishes can go and they can grow in about, almost about close to 30 days. You take it to winter time, they're gonna grow 60 days. So everything doubles. So during the summer, the warmer times, I was planting and harvesting all the time. But what I would do before winter, before it started getting cold and in the fall, was start planting big plantings of stuff. Like I would plant tons, tons of my lettuce, tons of that because I knew everything was gonna slow way down in growth. Because in the winter time, it's cooler and it takes more, everything's double. Like I said, the radishes go from 30 days to 60 days. So in the winter time, what I would do is start, before it got to winter, start prepping up for that winter. Start planting all your transplants at least that you can. Um, because even if you get them in kind of before winter, winter the growth slows way down that, you'll find that like lettuce and stuff will store in the ground pretty good through the winter. Now during the summer, it's like, I gotta harvest this or next week it's gonna, or in a couple of days, it's gonna bolt and try to go to seed. So it's like, I gotta hurry up. But in the winter, you kind of have more time, but you wanna bulk up for that, for the winter. See, in the winter, I wasn't planting 
See, in the, or the warmer times, I was planting every single week, just always. The winter, it kind of started slowing down because we did, we'd do a huge planting before winter time so we could be prepared. Now let's move to, to winter time. Now, winter time was obviously now everything's cold, everything's taking longer. This is, uh, this is a cloth basically. And what that's doing is depending on how the thickness of the cloth that you can get, you can raise the temperature anywhere from like, you know, three to eight degrees underneath there, which helps out a lot, right? Especially in the, in the warmer part of the day, it helps those plants. Like that's some, that's some of the inside of the spinach underneath one of those. Um, and it's the same technique as a shade cloth with the hoops. Um, so you just transfer. And so I would use, I would use um, this during the winter. And if that's where, if you can, um, did I put it in here? Yeah, I did. I'll talk about that in a minute. So in the, in the winter, I would get that cloth and things. That will help you go. That will help too with, um, you know, frost. Yeah, when it's freezing, it'll keep it, it'll keep it good enough. And you know, you, I found that, that a lot of, a lot of the stuff, you know, it's, it would survive through it. A lot of the greens and stuff were pretty, would, you would sometimes get frost tips or kind of on it, but most of the time it would survive pretty good. But with this cloth, and I knew there was a lot of freeze coming, especially certain vegetables, I'd be wanting to, sorry, back there. It's, um, I have it at the end. I have the site to get it from. I'm trying to remember exactly what it's called because there's different thickness. Now, this is the only problem with the thicker cloth, your overhead watering doesn't get through as good. With this cloth that I had on it, it wasn't as thick, it would get through pretty good. But if you have something like drip line, that's why I'm saying that sometimes that hybrid system's awesome because it's nice to switch back and forth. Um, so if you have a drip line, it doesn't really matter. You can keep that thing covered. And that's gonna help obviously with pest control as, as well. And you can use, you can buy that kind of material as well for pest control. Did you have a question back there? Sorry. Yeah, I would, so, if you were gonna, yeah, like in a raised bed type thing or whatever, I would. Like if I had a raised bed um, and I wanted to grow lettuce that summer, I would use shade cloth. But it would obviously, the only difference would just be on a, a lot smaller, or on a smaller scale of it. So yes, I, a, a lot of these principles, I think you can take to um, raised beds. Same with the winter time, you know, putting cloth on. Actually with a raised bed, what would kind of be cool is you could actually even um, do a mini version of this kind of basically and put kind of that plastic, four mil plastic material over it and keep a warm little climate. They call them caterpillar tunnels. Um, they make those too. Um, people would do that in like backwards, and, you know, it might snow and different things like that. But you could do that. And like, let's say if you had a, a raised bed, you could, you know, kind of, you could put, um, PVC pipe or whatever over it to make a little to make a little tunnel and do your whole little thing. So I mean, you can apply, take all these and apply it to you know whatever size scale you are. Um, so yeah, this was amazing. I always I actually never had one of these. All most all these pictures of mine, but this one I, I snagged just to show you guys. These hoop houses like this or these bigger structures like this are amazing in the winter because everything's growing way quicker and faster because it's warmer in there. So if you can, you know, if you had land room to do something like that, that would be, this would be a really cool option. Obviously this is like, a, you can get smaller ones, all sorts of sizes. And that's what all these principles inside, you can take it to big, small, whatever you, whatever you guys need to do to make it fit um, what you're working with. Okay, let's go to pe the pest management. So again, my biggest things that I felt like I, dealt with the most were, uh, again, aphids, caterpillars, and like sometimes I remember one year I had horrible, the squash bugs they just took over those. Um, so aphids aren't a huge problem until you have tons of them. And then or it looks like salt and pepper or something on your, your leaf. So I wanna give you guys methods that are gonna actually work. And I know there's a lot of methods that people say and different stuff, but at least on the scale I was doing like a lot of like these home remedies did not work. And so I'll go through what I would do. And this was, 
I'll get to that one last, but I would try to stay as organic and everything as I could, which all these except the last one are totally organic because the first thing, it's Arbico, does anyone know? A-R-B-I-C-Co organics. Write that one down, guys, because that is what I would do is I would get lacewing larvae from them. And lacewing larvae work better than the caterpillars and stuff because the larva actually is gonna stay there. They can't fly away yet, right? So you get lacing, lacewing larva. And what I would do is I would just start even before I saw signs of them or especially during the warmer times when I knew they were starting to come and see a few of them. And I would go around and I would just start spreading them. And guys, they, and you do that periodically and they would keep the, they would keep the aphids at bay. Cause I had times where they just, t- aphids just took over, man. It was like, oh man. And I tried like neem oil, all sorts of stuff and nothing worked. But this beneficial bug, man, they went to town. I wanna say they can eat like 1200 a, a, of those aphids a day, just one little larva. So they'll go to town on those things. And so lacewing larva, what I found was the best for, um, aphid problems and they would keep it at bay. And you know what, if you have a little bit, it was no, if you, you're gonna have some stuff, you, you wash, wash them off, but it's when they go crazy and overtake because what they're doing is trying to get sugar and they'll just, they suck your plant dry if you start getting tons of them. But you have them here and there, these things, the lacewing larvae were perfect. They kept it at bay. And if you have a, you know, just in your backyard, um, doing like the raised bed and different things, um, you don't have to buy as many and just, I would sprinkle, I think on the website, they'll break it down for you too of how many you need. Once the how long do they last? So I believe it was a couple, I believe it was a couple weeks. So what I would do is uh, during the bath, I was like, I would get them, you could get them every few weeks or once a month or something. I would think if you, on a, let's say, you know, on a smaller scale, I wouldn't think you would have to keep getting as much. I think, you know, that would help keep them at bay. And just as you start seeing signs, just maybe order another thing. Cause it's quick ordering. I think it, it's overnight. So um, I would, what I would, what I was doing was I believe every f- few weeks or once a month, I was ordering some during the times I saw them the worst. And then I wouldn't order them for a while and have no problems with them. Like, you know, so it was kind of a back and forth thing. So the next thing, caterpillars were a huge thing. I've seen, I've had, cat, oh, sorry, back there real quick. I found that the lace wings were, I found that they were the most effective. Um, I found, especially, um, or ladybug larvae would be better, but big ladybugs, it's keeping them there because they'll fly away on you, yeah. you know? You can get a bunch of them and they all take off on you and you're like, oh, where'd you guys go? Um, they go to your neighbors and help them out. <laughs> so, uh, so I found lace, I found that the green lace wings was the best, the best that I found that worked great for me. The next thing, the next product was caterpillars. I had a big problem with it. And I've seen the caterpillars just, again, I've had them just destroy entire things. What works the best is a product, Conserve was what I would use a lot, but it's called Spinosad or BT. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of that, but Spinosad or BT is, is the ingredient in it. Now, Spinosad, um, all it is, is uh, it's a bacteria from the soil that's completely safe and organic for animals, humans, anyone. But for when the caterpillar consumes it, it kills them. And I mean, it worked, it was the first organic product that I ever used that was just like, it worked great. I, as soon as I started seeing them, I would spray this. And it's, it's like, I wanna say, it's like a little dab in like a gallon of, I mean, you, you don't hardly have to use any of it too. It worked uh, in water. It was amazing. It was, um, it just wiped those things out. It was awesome. I, so that's something else I would uh, use a lot. So I got, squ- I had squash bugs bad one time, really bad, just destroyed an entire row. My entire bed was totally, completely gone. 
I had another row further down. That's something else that you guys wanna think about is when you're planting certain things, is spacing them. Like say you put your squashes here and then some other plants here and then something down the other squashes over here so they're not just jumping, trying to grow some distance between you know, the infestation. Luckily, they hadn't got to that side yet, but, they, but one year what I had to do is seven, seven or seven dust or any of that, it's, I don't believe it's organic. But when it comes down to it is we did everything organic. I mean, we were, we were way further than organic because I mean, organic, who, I mean, all the labeling, just like sustainable or free range or whatever. There's all these marketing words. But guys, we weren't putting, these were all, we used lace wings all the time and then we would use that when we have them. We put nothing on these things unless we absolutely had to. Um, so the seven I don't think is organic, but when it comes down to, I'm gonna lose all this stuff, I, you know, spraying it once, I would, to save my, my crop. And I would, tell, I would tell my people and stuff, and I don't, I don't know, I don't think it's a horrible thing. I mean, there's organic, organic products that are higher toxicity than, you know, other conventional things. So that's something that was always, that was like a last resort thing, especially with like squash bugs or something, because just anything I had, I couldn't get rid of them. And they were just going to town on me. Uh, so those are three of the products that I would recommend with that. Um, and then I would also recommend, especially if you're able to like with the race thing, I would just put some, I would put a netting over it, some kind of bug netting just to help you out right there from the beginning. As soon as you plant, put that over. Um, that would be a great idea to do as well. Um, trying to think of any other I mean, we've had other things. I've had, I've had slugs before. Um, they make some different products for that. Oh, are they? Have you usually, and I mean, not, not always, but have you checked if you have, a, that if you have aphids? Because what the ants are doing is the aphids make honeydew that's sweet and the ants come and they want that. It's actually crazy, guys. The ants will eat off the um, aphids' wings because they and make them like slaves to them, basically, so they can't fly away because they, they're making food for them. So that's why if you see ants, you're probably gonna see aphids on your, on your plant. And um, so... If, again, if you're doing like peppers or something like that and you know you have a few different plants, another way just to quick, try to do quick fixes if you're having aphids right away is if you can is lightly, you know, pull the leaves back and try to just rinse them, rinse them off and, and get them down. And then, um, but I believe, I wanna say this product worked on, maybe worked on ants, worked on a few different things, but that's probably why you ants. Usually if you see ants, it's because of aphids. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, really? That wouldn't surprise me. You can't get conserved? Are you serious? Okay, I would find another product that was, uh, that was spinosad or BT in it. Okay. And it was actually developed in Israel. Oh, it is a natural bacteria. And once it's consumed by the larva, it, crea it uh, reacts. Like their digestive system? Yeah. And then it causes the insect, it expands, and it makes the insect think it's full. So it will mm. stop eating. And, and then so it's... it's... It was first used in mosquito control. Oh, really? Hmm. No, well, that, well thank you. You were, she was on that more than BTI. BTI. Okay. Um, yes. Um, what m mushrooms? Um, honestly, 
mushrooms and stuff aren't always bad because of, you know, that, you're, you might ha- that might be good. Um, got a lot of organic uh, material, different things in there in your soil. So, I mean, I would get them sometimes uh, in my compost or different things. Sometimes they'd sprout out. Um, I don't have, I mean, besides just pulling them out, I don't have anything to, to stop them, I guess, that I could think of off the top of my head, like for mushrooms and things. Um, the other thing I won't know with you guys, I had a horror, at the last farm I was at, a horrible squirrel problem. Like horrible, like thousands of squirrels Every I was off 65 for most, so they were everywhere. If you have a few of them, you can get some traps, you can have them, you can get them quick. But guys, I had them so bad. I've had them wipe out like, so like a hundred, like a 50 foot or a hundred foot bed, I would have like 800 heads of lettuce or, and they would, I've had them come and wipe them totally out. I, I gotta tell you guys, I uh, got to a point where I showed absolute no mercy to those things. <laughs> I k- killed them in all sorts of ways. If it was with a gun, a trap, I'm not gonna lie, guys. I, I chased, I had a fence that ran up against the fence. So I got one with a stick one time. And I used to, when you first do it, you're kind of like, oh, you know, like, well. But when they start doing that to your stuff, you're like, dude, I don't even feel bad. I don't even feel bad for you. <laughs> but, um, so hopefully you guys won't have that problem, but it was horrible out there. And I even got to a point where I put a, um, a fence up that, um, with chicken wire, buried it a foot underneath the ground or a foot or two underneath the ground all the way around the farm and then put electric things and that stopped for a little bit. Then they still, they figured, they figured out. out. They're the smart, yeah, they will never stop. So if you have a few of them, trap them, get rid of them. It's easy, it's quick. You know, if you, you know, if you're having a, just a few come in, but I'm ta- there was no way to get rid of them. God. I'm talking thousands and it was a nonstop problem. Um, so anyways, just a little side note. I don't like squirrels. <laughs> but weed, weed control. There it is. <laughs> That's pretty much, I mean, I, what I would do is, what I would do a lot of times is this is what I was talking about with flame weeding that you could even, like when I was saying, you could make your little circles in your landscape fabric to plant. But the, what I would do a lot of times before I started, be, when I was prepping my next bed, right? And pulling everything out, I would go through and I would flame weed it and all the little ones and try to you know, kill as much as you can and maybe put a little new fresh compost on top and then plant again. So flame weeding was a, was a great way. And then this is what I was talking about, guys, was making just a little circle in that landscape fabric and then it makes it where you can plant and you have your drip line underneath and yeah. You know, those were two things I never have grown. <laughs> but um, so um, I didn't, It might be rodents. That's probably, no, that's probably, I would say, um, would be a squirrel or a, or a gopher. Or a raccoon. Okay, rats. It's some kind of rodent for sure. Do you know what, a, I would go, f- really? I would go with a, I would look into a trap that maybe near, near it and trap, the thing. I mean, that's probably your best to stop it, to get it to stop. But gophers on a side note, have you guys seen the gopher hawk before? This thing was amazing for gophers. If you have a little, you have that and you, you push it down into snare and you just put it in their hole. And when they hit it, it sucks them up. You pull them out, dispose of them. And it works. It's, I think it was, is it the gopher hawk? Is that what it's called? Work, work, is it working good for you guys? Yeah, we have half a dozen of them or so. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, yeah. It's always. Oh no. <laughs> um, okay. Also, I should have put it on here. There's some cool. I had a thing, um, and I'll show it. Never sink farms. I'll show them later. Uh, later on the list, they sell it, and so it, it's kind of it, basically it's kind of like a hula ho. It's the same concept, but it's just metal, a metal um, wire basically. 
and they're all different sizes. So there is, so you could fit in between, like while your little arugula sprouts are growing up, you could fit in between it. They also had ones that maybe had a little um, gap so you could push down and there's just different attachments. So you just click them in. Um, that was another great little product I would use for why they were growing. Landscape fabric around all your perimeters, anywhere that's getting wet. So anywhere that you can, I would just landscape fabric around the, that's what I did. So at the end of my beds, all the way around all the place, I just, just landscape fabric that helps cut down on the, the weeds around at least. And it's just a non-step battle. And it is, it is what it is, hand pulling weeds, um, just trying to keep up on them. If you can get them while they're small, it's a lot, easy, it's a, it's a lot easier. So that's basically my weed control methods were, were this. And so even though we were doing this full time, and you can see we weren't using, you know, like your conventional farms and tractors and all sorts of stuff. I mean, we were using, there's, it's amazing the tools out there, guys, for the small scale farming now. And in the small scale farming community, it's usually people are anywhere from a quarter to an uh, acre or two. And that's all they're doing. And they're doing it full time. They're very profitable. And once you start getting bigger, you start getting less profitable because you're having to lower prices and do that. But when you're doing it, this method, if anyone's interested in farming like this and actually maybe trying to make something out of it is um, you grow high profitable greens um, and radishes, things that are quick days to maturity that you're able to keep growing and flipping over and churning. And... Um, you know, making subscription plans. People want to know the farmer. People want to direct sell. So it's, it's a great little method. Um, okay, harvesting. So this is the Salvanova lettuce, guys. If you want to write that down, it's spelled, let me double check how it's spelled. It is S-A, I know it's not Salmonella. <laughs> it's S-A-L-A-N-O-B-A. This is the best, the best le lettuce as far as everything, the quality. And so in it, yeah. Oh, you know what? It's, it's probably a, it's probably a hybrid um, or it's, it's its own cat. I don't even remember. I'm sorry guys. It's been a while. It's been a little bit. I'm losing my farming mind. Um, but what's great about it is it was, there's oak leaves, there's, uh, Salvanova had, there's oak leaves, there's butter leaves, there's um, kind of the frilly leaves, all these things. So you can see in here, there's a mixture of different ones. And right here, there's, these are like oak leaves. That's kind of a frilly one. Um, there's green and reds too on all of them. Green oak leaves, red oak leaves, green butters, red butters. And you can get a variety pack. And that's what I would do. I would just plant all the different ones. What's cool about these is you go in, these are kind of a little bit smaller, they get a little bit more up. You grab them and you leave, you don't cut from the very bottom. You wanna leave some a little bit underneath, a um, couple inches or so above, cut it and they fall apart. And, what, and how, when I'm harvesting, I would always have a tote with me and I would cut them and uh, I would ha usually have the tote in front. So I just keep moving back and moving it. So I would cut them and it just falls right apart into these perfect little leaves. So you have your bag lettuce or your, you know, perfect, ready to go. This lettuce would hold up like three weeks before it started getting slimy or anything. Um, I, it was just a premium, it was a great lettuce. So I would highly recommend. And so the great thing I, again, and I meant to mention this more during the planning was planting stuff that are cut and come again. So what I mean by that is like this Salvanova lettuce, you would cut it above a little bit and it will grow back and you can get two to three more cuttings out of it. Arugula, you can get, uh, depending on the season, two to four cuttings out of it where you're cutting it and you're coming back. Um, oh, we're on harvesting. Yeah, I'm gonna get into that. Sorry, that's I'm in the right spot. Um, so when would you know that you had the last cutting? It yeah, it just would kind of, yeah. Salva, what I would do with my Salvanova because we were planting so much I would maybe go back for a second, but I never really went back for more. But if you're just at the, especially if you're just growing for yourself, just cutting it and growing back. But like a, a root, when you start seeing the decline where it's like, okay, I think I've kind of beat this thing to death maybe. Um, but arugula, uh, cut and come again. Spinach, you can get multiple cuttings out of it. Um, 
Kel, baby Kel, even big Kel, or even Swiss chard. So that's another crop, like Swiss chard guys, you're just breaking off a leaf here and there. And they'll come out and you're, you'll get, gosh, I would go months off of pulling off of a Swiss chard for months, just being able to. Um, so those are the other things you wanna look into are things that you're planning, you're able to cut and you're able to come back. Um, again, in a couple of weeks and cut it again. So it's just, that's, those are other things you wanna look at. Um, my head lettuce. So what I would do with my head lettuce is you can harvest it and cut it. But what I would do a lot of times with you guys um, is I would actually pull the, the root out and I would, I would wash you know, the, kind of the dirt and stuff off. And then for me, since we had a walk-in fridge, I was putting them in totes and I would put a little bit of water in them and leave the roots on and stick them in there and shut it. And you could do that kind of, it keeps them, it keeps them going longer, holds up even better after harvest time. Um, so maybe if leaving the roots on. Honestly, I used to leave the roots on a lot of stuff. I'll show you guys on like green onion too. I used to leave, leave, I used to leave all the roots on them too. Um, and stuff would just hold up really good. It wouldn't go bad on you as quick. And obviously we wanna, you know, stock up as much as I can. Here's another cool little tool. Um, so when it came to arugula or different things like that, how I would originally harvest is I would get a knife, I would have a tote and I was just grabbing and cut. And that's again, one of the nice about that 30 inch wide bed and you just start walking back. Another tool that saved me and saved my back was this thing. Um, it's called the uh, greens harvester, quick cut greens harvester. And it's just a drill. It doesn't come with a drill, but it's that, but you have a drill, you stick it on. There's a blade here that cuts, this thing spins and you literally walk down like your arugula bed or your kale bed or spinach and it's flinging it back into that bag. And once it's full, you dump it in your tote and just keep going. So there's a, that's what I was saying. There's a lot of cool tools guys for as you go on. So that was another cool tool. Otherwise I would just use a knife or you know, whatever you, knife or scissors or something. I would just use a knife and you work backwards and, and cut and throw it in mustard greens were another one that you could cut multiple times. Um, and so here would be, we'll talk a little bit about this. So with green onion and carrots, things like that, you guys remember that little fork thing I showed you in the beginning that that guy was holding? A lot of times I would use, depending on how hard your soil is, a lot of times I would use that thing. Just go down and just loosen everything up, then come back and be easy to pull up your stuff. And I would leave, so like those are my green onions, I would just leave all the roots on them, held up longer. Um, so, and so how I would harvest that, um, with these things is I would use a fork. Now, my radish and turnips and beets, usually I could just pluck right out. And so what I would do a lot of times if the guys were harvesting a lot is I would wrap a, couple of rub I would wrap a bunch of rubber bands around one of your fingers, whichever side. I would pull, I'd get my bundle, I would twist them and just put them to the side and you just keep, you keep doing that. And you, you get better and better and quicker and quicker, but just put them on your finger and I would just make bundles. So my carrots and all that, that's how I would do it. And I would just, I would just pull them in, make a nice little bundle and uh, do that. So that's radish, turnips, things like that. That's how I would harvest those types of crops. So the, the green onions, maybe even the, pur the purple red onions, kind of the harder stuff that you feel like maybe you're gonna break off, um, like your carrot tops, you break it off and don't get the carrot out. Use a little fork thing and just loosen that soil up. They all doing it. Looks like looks like some puny thing. It could be, it could be something. It could be a lack of something in the soil, some kind of nutrient that they're not getting. Um, it could possibly be survival mode. Maybe they think they're going to die, so those green tops are going big and they're trying to get to seed to because to sell to produce before they die out. Um, that's something that you'll notice too. And they, if you notice plants, they feel like they're not getting the nutrients, feeling like they're die. They're, they wanna start, I call it bolting. They wanna start bolting and going to seeds so they can continue on, I guess, you know, have more seeds. Um, so I would assume something like that. I mean, I would have it sometimes here and there with different stuff or like my beets, especially beets. And it might be the varieties too that you're, that you're picking. I know sometimes they have some that are smaller. So it could be a lack of some kind of nutrients. It's hard to say. And that's what's hard on a lot of things. Sometimes you're just like, 
why is this happening? Or why is this? And you, there's so many different, you start Googling stuff and then there's like a thousand different reasons and you're like, I don't know which one. So I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not much help there on that one. Um, but those, it could be a lack. So I will say something else that I, I, that I didn't say is compost is another huge thing. And then f- as far as fertilizing guys, there was a, what I would use sometimes was there was a dry turkey. Like I know I said not to use manure, but there was a dry turkey manure. You know, it was cured, it was good. You could put that down. Um, there's different stuff like that. But another product I would use a lot was like kelp extract. Um, and there's fish and kelp extract, things like that. And it's a foliar, foliar spray where you're gonna spray it on the leaves. And the best times are, I believe, early in the morning were the best times because they're kind of more open than the leaves and stuff. And there's some good products out there. I would look into like kelp extract, things like that. And you come every about every two weeks or so and you know, a little Hudson spray or something, just spray it all on the leaves and that's giving more nutrients and things to that. So um, I hope that could be another thing that could maybe, maybe help. Um, so that's another thing. Um, where was I at? Uh, so yeah, the carrots, I would use a fork, loosen them up. Cause yeah, I've, pull, I've pull, pulled off plenty of carrot tops. And then of course it's always the best, it's the best carrot too. It's like, oh, this one was perfect. And I ripped the top off. Um, and it just looks better with the top when you're selling it, I guess. I guess you don't really, most people don't use the top. So those were Swiss chard. So that was, I was saying like Swiss chard plants, guys. Like I would just come in and cut off all the big leaves. Cause I mean, goodness, man, Swiss chard leaves can get, I've had them bigger than my face. You can let them get really, those things will get really big. And so you just come in, pick your best ones and you can keep coming back on those and go like that. And you can saute them, do different stuff, try to break them down, try to get them to kind of like, I guess you could try to use them as like a substitute of spinach or something like that, you know? Those were a great hardy crop, a good one. And I had good success with it growing them year round. Um, bok choy was another one I grew. And I would harvest bok choy kind of the same too. I would just pull the whole, the whole roots out with the bok choy. Here's this little technique with basil. So this is my basil bed. And this is what I would do with basil a lot. they call like pinching. And you can get a lot out of them. And I would just pinch the tops off and you got your basil leaves and they'll keep, they'll keep going. And I believe by that pinching process, I remember right, it would make the plant produce more and more, right? So you just pinch, you're just pinching like the tops off of your basil. So that was a good one. Um, cilantro and parsley, other herbs that were on, on that topic, I would cut them. I got, I remember one year, man, parsley, I got like five cuttings off of this parsley, man. I was just going in, cutting, I would just bundle up some and it just kept coming back. Um, cilantro, I'd get multiple cuttings off of. Cilantro seemed to want to bolt on you quicker, but parsley was a really good hearty one, another hearty herb, basil. Um, dill, dill was a good one. I used to get quite a bit off dill. And the same thing with dill, I was just kind of plucking off as it grows the best parts and it kept regrowing. So those are all good crops because you get to come back and you're just picking off them. And especially for your house, if you guys are just going out and you're like, you know, I'm just going to cut a, pick a few leaves for a salad or something, you know, you can come back and that's another option on your head lettuce. Maybe if you're just wanting to grab like on a big romaine, just a couple leaves off, then don't pull it out yet. Just let it keep growing and supplying you longer, you know, and just keep it in the ground, keep it growing. I mean, you could just pluck off leaves as you need it. So those are other options. Um, we got 725. You guys getting sick of me yet? Or are we still good? <laughs> uh, post, post harvest. So post harvest, I kind of was touching all that. I would band them. I kind of had this, I would have this rack here. I would just spray all my root vegetables all down. I would just basically spray them all off um, with your, you know, a hose and you could put down some kind of rack and spray them all off. And uh, I would keep them in totes, but I mean, you could obviously, you guys are putting them in, containers. I notice a lot of times I think keeping them in things and keeping air and stuff out of them seem to hold up, hold up better. Um, this was my lettuce wash. If you guys were getting into some big, wanting to, you guys are cutting like a bunch of lettuce. Um, this is what I would do. So it's really interesting. So that's all PVC pipe down there. I would drill 
little holes all the way down around that. This wasn't my exact, I had the same concept here. I, mine looked like that, but I didn't have this little piece, but I would drill little holes all around it. And then I had a hot tub pump and I just stuck it over the top, plugged it in and it shot up and made all those bubbles. And I would dump my lettuce and all my greens in there and that would knock off all, any of the dirt, any of the bugs or anything like that. And then the next thing I would do is get a laundry sack and uh, I would have a laundry basket too, just because it fit good. And I'd put it there and I would pile in all my lettuce and we had a, uh, um, a washer just for the post harvesting that you can buy. And so I'd put all that in, put that in, string it, drop it into the washer, put it on uh, spin and drain and it would go around and it would dry all your lettuce and then I would package my lettuce. So that was a really, so small farms, what they've done, they actually make a fitting now for it, like a little basket that you set in to the washer and that would spin. So like your salad spinner, but on a bigger version of it. Um, so that's how we used to do our, our lettuce and post harvest. Um, and you, you know, you, so right off from, now this is kind of like, this was on like a Friday morning, probably getting ready to do deliveries. But what I would use is, I just wanted to kind of show you guys some is those, I would use these bags, I would seal them. And then I don't know if you guys can kind of see, you guys see in the bottom of the containers and all that, that little, it's just a little moisture pad. So like you can use a paper towel or whatever, just stick it in there. And whatever you guys are using, putting it, put it in there and that just helped. And it helped, it would hold up in that bag, like no, no problem. Um, and then I had little containers um, too as well, little clamshells um, for different things or microgreens and different stuff. Uh, but again, yeah, keeping the roots on, all those little things, just little tricks trying to keep things longer. All right, guys, we're almost at the end. Microgreens, I want to touch on them real quick because this is something any of you guys could do at your house. You could do it with lights. This was part of my, this was my first little setup that I did. Microgreens are further along than sprouts. They're basically small versions of whatever, broccoli, um, radishes, anything really, any plant. And so what you do with microgreens is you will grow them. These are the after product of them all. And you can see, but the nutrition value is way higher than the other. An ounce of microgreen broccoli, that little baby stage where it's just the leaf and the cotyledons, the little two leaves, is um, an ounce of microgreen broccoli is like eating a pound of mature broccoli. Um, they can be anywhere from six to 40 times more nutritious than mature type of plants. Um, it started off with chefs using them for flavor and looks and things because they're really, there's some really cool ones like the beets and there's like a beets fool's blood and they're really pretty, but then they have a lot of flavor. Like I used to grow a cilantro one, man. If you love cilantro, it was, in, it was even, it was strong. It was amazing. I love the cilantro one, but um, they have good flavor and things as well. So how, this is like what you would do is that's, the, that's kind of the end product and you guys can see them growing. So this is the other cool thing about them, guys. You buy these trays. I'll show you guys some places you can get them. I like getting the inch trays, I feel like, because airflow works better than you can get the deeper trays. And what you do is you would fill up soil. So I'd fill up soil all in that tray. I would compact them. I would take like a little piece of wood and just kind of compact it so it's a little like that. I would measure out my seeds. So I would measure out broccoli. I don't know, I might do like... Um, Gosh, I can remember less than an, less than an ounce, like a little less than an ounce or something. And then I would do them as, um, a lot of times I just do them in those red solo cups or whatever, I just weigh them out, tear it, weigh them out, all the seeds I needed. Then you get it with soil, then you come in and you just all the way across and then you don't do anything else. On certain ones I would put, I don't want to, well, I don't want to make it too, most of the broccoli, all of them, most of the time, that's all you do. So they're just laying on the top of that. Then I would plant a couple more. Then I would stack them. I would put weight on them and I would keep them in the dark like that or whatever for about three days or whenever you start seeing, they will actually push those bricks up. And the weight, what the weight's doing is it's pushing the roots down and the plant up and it's making them sturdy and they'll actually start coming up. Then like this last, this picture I had, then I would bring them out to the light. You can harvest these and you can grow these in about two weeks. 
two to three weeks, depending on the type. Um, herbs take a little longer. Radishes during the warm time, uh, I would, like eight days, those things were ready to cut. These are kind of like some radish microgreens right here. That's how they would look. And they taste like radish. And uh, uh, these are uh, pea shoots. And the pea shoots are good. Like people throw them like Alfredo and sauce and different things. People put them on sand, all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's something though, let's say something that you could at least, you could do this anywhere. Guys, you could do this in the garage. The other thing is they're extremely profitable. Um, of course, in Bakersfield, they're not as huge or it hasn't got around, but you go down to the Bay Area or LA and different stuff, and there's people making um, $10,000 a month out of their garage growing these things, like making a couple grand a week off growing these. Um, chefs love them, people love them, like, you know, you get into different areas. So that's another cool about them. That's one of the reasons that I uh, started at first looking into them. I just heard they were really high profitable when I was starting out, not having a lot of room. You know, you're trying to figure all that out. But let's just say you, you don't have much room. Guys, you can do this at home. Just these were, I had, later on I got some grow, um, some strip lights. Honestly, they were the best. Those were shop lights right there, I think, um, that I just threw up. And you can grow them on racks. You know the metal, I wish I had a picture. I didn't have a picture, but you have a metal racks. Like a, you can get them at Costco, different things. And you can put little lights on them. And let's just say, you know, food shortage and different things like that, I mean, at least it's something, something you can cut and get right away, something you can grow extremely fast. Um, so and another tip, another thing to look into, and this is how I'd harvest them with, I would just get a knife and you just cut just a little above the soil and uh, throw them in. So, all right, so let's get down. We'll wrap this, we'll start wrapping this up and let me get you guys some, yeah. You yeah, you can use LED. Um, I'm trying to remember, like, gosh, it's 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 been such a it's been a while since I do it. It's funny how you start blanking on stuff, but I'm trying to remember the exact lights we use. But hit me up later because I can, or you know, if you guys are interested in the lights, I can get you the right lights. I just I gotta ask my wife because <laughs> she knows the info on that one. Um, so seed seed companies. So seeds are a huge thing, right? These were the top, these were the three companies that I used all the time. Johnny Seeds, I used tons to get my Salvanova lettuce to get. There were so many cool varieties, guys. Um, even like churnips, like, you know how you have your big old churnips with the purple things? Look into like Hakkari churnips. They're not as quite big. They're really sweet. Those are really good. Um, so they, they just, Johnny Seeds was probably my top. I bought tons from Johnny Seeds. True Leaf Market, I would mostly use for my microgreen seeds. I would supply them. Then Kita Zavwa, I'm saying that right? Kita Zavwa was um, just a few different things as well, another place. So those are three companies that I use con constantly. So I wanted to let you guys. So with seeds, guys, you can stock up on some seeds. My advice for storing to help you go longer Put them in the freezer. I still have seeds in the, the freezer. That'll, that helps store longer as well um, as keeping them. I put them in the freezer. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised one day that, you know, this was a currency that you could use, you know, some seeds. You can. So I did, and maybe I never, I never did, um, but like arugula, like you could basically you could leave arugula and it would probably, it, all those seeds fall and it grows right back up. But you can, you can collect. And see, that's what's nice about some of these cut and come again crops is like, let's say, um, let's say just using arugula. And I know that's probably not your a favorite vegetable for everyone here, but I'm just using it as a good example is uh, you could get multiple cuttings off arugula, then quit cutting it. It will bolt and go to seeds and then collect the seeds off of it. So you got multiple eating's off of something and that. Same with like, same with the Salvanova lettuce. You know, you could cut it a few times, then let it grow back up and bolt, let it go to seed. Um, so those are options too. And you can get more into how you do that all as well as, you know, with um, some, of the, some of the people might cover it that I'll show you guys. Um, but, you know, you too and everything's great. Um, always a great tool to, <laughs> to use. There's always people explain stuff. But so that's what's cool though about that too, is being able to get food out of it and, Get some seeds off of it. So those are the seed companies. Um, 
tools and planning supplies. And if you guys wanna take pictures or write this down, this also is gonna be recorded, so we'll be able to, if you, you know, or if people online are looking, you can pause it and screenshot this. Bootstrap farmers, uh, I would get a lot of my trays from. Uh, Paper Pot Co. was that transplanter I was talking about. Never Sink Farm was the one that had that cool weeding tool and some, they have, he has some other products. Johnny Seeds has um, some cool tools and material and things. So row cover, shake cloth and weed fabric I would get from shakeclothstore.com and Farmer's Friend is another, another company for your, those, I, I know some of you guys were asking about that. Those are places to get all, all of that. Um, am I okay to flip the slide? You guys got it all? No? Okay. Um, just let me know when I, uh, let's see. Got us some free time to talk. Uh, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have. And that's what, again, especially that broccoli one does some, there's some studies in it, does some amazing, amazing thing on fighting cancer and all that. So the microgreens, again, is a, is a good one, guys. And it's a easy thing. It's an easy thing to grow. And I guess, you know, and I rather, in hard time, I'd rather eat that than bugs for sure, you know. <laughs> Where did you get a lot of your compost? A lot of my compost, so the, when I first started, I, when I first started, I just went to the uh, bulk yard. They had some organic compost there and I just ordered a truckload when I first started. And honestly, it was good compost. They get it from another, I think they get it from another place and then bring it. That's, so the other place I cannot remember, there was one company that we got right at the end after we got that really bad compost from another company. We went to this other company and they were great. And they'll even like mix, you can tell them what you want and they'll mix your soil and do all sorts of stuff. But um. So there's a couple companies in town, but if you're just looking like Volker, honestly, I I had no, I couldn't complain. Honestly, it was good compost. We've gotten some from Greenways, but it's not you know, clean. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of glass. Yes. And see, that's the hard part. It is. And see, that's the hard part about getting it from like places like that. Is yeah, you're dealing with all this other stuff. You can make your own compost. But that starts getting into another thing and it's a long process and you've got to keep working on it, but you can, you can start building it up. Can you describe how you set up your uh, shop like you use four as well as you three and did you make the arms where you hang them from the ceiling? Okay, so I wish I had a picture. What I ended up doing is getting those metal racks and what I did, I think I tried a few different things. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're just the shelving. Um, so it was like, I don't know, like six shelves or something. And the other thing is you want to probably, probably about this. You don't, the reason you don't want to go too high with your lights is they'll start stretching and they'll start reaching. And then, um, so you want to make sure they're getting two lights. And towards the end, what I found was the best is I, I wish I, I'll have to look it up and I'll try to, if you're interested, I'll try to email you the lights that I use. They were really cool lights. And I did, um, I'm trying to remember all. I did two. I did one kind of in the middle of the back of the shelf and one kind of in the middle of the front of the shelf. Yeah, they were grow. I'm trying to remember what they were. They were perfect. So if anyone's interested on some of that, I'll try to nail some of that info down so I could get it back to you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry on some of this stuff, guys, that I don't have it. So, um, but I can try to remember those, figure out those lights. But um. Yeah, did, did everyone get this one though? Am I good to flip to the, okay. And I think this is the last, this is the last slide guys. So farms to follow. These guys are all on YouTube and different places you can follow these farms. These guys will be great helps into different stuff, into com, how to do my own compost, how to grow certain things, how to harvest certain things. So Never Sink Farms is a good one, Steadfast, is great. I learned a lot from them on growing in the heat there in Arizona. They're the ones I got the whole idea from, from the shade cloth. Curtis Stone, I wish I had his book. Curtis Stone, Urban Farmer. He has a book um, that's, that might be a great book to maybe get. 
He does a lot of other stuff. What he's doing now, he used to run a small farm. He was the one I said in the beginning that was farming the backyards, but he got really in, especially during COVID to prepping and all that stuff and like switched his whole thing. But if you go back to his old stuff, you, he has videos, guys, on everything imaginable. Each, how do I plant this one? How do I harvest this vegetable? How do I do that? I mean, he has tons. He's a great resource for a lot of, a lot. He, uh, amazing resource on all that stuff. He, I learned a lot from him in the beginning. He was probably the most out of all these guys. When I first started, was really looking at him. I don't know what he's got going on now, but you go back to his old stuff on YouTube. Does he? Okay. Yeah, I haven't even looked him up in forever. Does he? Yeah, he's doing more off-grid stuff, which is also cool too, probably. It would fit in with, I'm sure, a lot of people interested in that too. He kind of went, started going that route, but totally different from like when he started. So, yeah, he is in, he is in Canada, but he's, he has a lot of good resources. Rose Creek is down in the south. I want to say they're in Tennessee. They're another, a good one on, and having to learn how to grow in like humidity, all sorts of stuff. Um, that's another one. Uh, Jean Martif, I'm not even going to, I call him, just call him JM. A lot of people just call him JN, but he's, uh, he's another like, he's like French Canadian. He has the thing called a market gardener that you can look up to that has great stuff. So the first, so never stink. Never Sink, Steadfast, and Rose Creek are all here in the, in the America, in the States. And then Curtis Stone and, and the other guy are up in um, Canada. Okay, so those are all guys that, because I know that was probably a huge overload and uh, kind of just touching on everything. I know there's a lot more we could get into. So I wanted to give you guys all those resources that you can dive in deeper. So I hope that was helpful. Um, again, um, I think as the time goes on, we need to be smart. We need to prepare. We need to do these type of things. But ultimately, we need to spiritually prepare. And that means what's our, what's our weak spots? What are things that we need to work on? And figure those things out so we're spiritually ready as well to face this and be able to stand against all that's coming our way. And so that's another huge thing I just want to hit is, is looking into growing in our theology, and, but of course, growing in, our, in ourselves, like I said, what's our weak points? What's our weak spots? What am I not submitting to God in yet? There, what areas do I, am I not yielding to him? And, and those are all areas that we have to fix as long as well with you know, the physical things that we can do and prep and prepare as well. So I'll end with that. Any, we all good right now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. I think it was, honestly, I think it was the, I think it was the cheap stuff. What's, is that the, what grade is that? The 20 grade? Oh, it was, I think it was just three quarter or three quarter it did. Yeah. It was three quarter for, for my, um, now for the other thing, that little bubbler that I used, I want to say that was, was one or I was like, it was, might've been two, uh, I can't remember. But anyways, yeah, it was three quarter for the hoop house. Um, it could have been half inch. I'm sorry, guys. It's been a while on some of this stuff. Uh, I'm doing a lot of this off, off the top of the head here. So, um, And then did you have another one? Sorry. You know, I never paid attention, but honestly, I'm sure maybe it does. Maybe for sunlight and sun purposes, maybe there is a better direction. I always just went more with what what direction fit and what where could I maximize space, honestly, is what I, the directions I would put stuff because I always just try to maximize all the, any space I, I could and things like it, or that's the best thing I would think. So, I'm sure there's something that might play a part to that. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any ideas on that, but. uh, Yeah, and so like shade can like, if you're growing close to a wall, shade can be 
an awesome help sometimes on some of your vegetables during the summertime, but then it's not very helpful when it's cold and that's just not helping the problem either. So, you know, those are things you all want to look at. What, where am I getting my sunlight? What's the best direction? What's, um, um, and picking an area too, does, is there, is there, um, what's the grass, um, Bermuda? Is there Bermuda grass that wants to grow here? Cause I'm never going to get rid of that stuff because you can't kill it. And I had a, I grew in an area where part of my farm had Bermuda grass and it was just, it didn't, I didn't matter what you did with that thing. It just kept coming back. So those are all things, you know, you, as you're starting your plot, you want to think about, you know? Um, yeah. So any other thing? <laughs> You know, not that, I mean, not that I know of yet, but um, I don't know, Ron, and you got like, you guys are heading that up. Have you guys heard anything? Um, nothing on that. Is, um, and you know, it's not a bad idea too. Like, I don't know if anyone has, you know, people that maybe have land or people that want to partner up and grow different things together or, you know, guys get the fellowship even here, get contact with who you guys can all be calling and hey, this worked, this didn't work and come over and learn from each other too. It's a great, since you guys are all here, it's a great place too. If there's anyone maybe grabbing people's numbers today and different things might be a great idea as well. So I think what we'll do is we'll end there. I'll hang out here if people want to talk more for a little bit, but we'll go, did you have Yeah, I mean, that, that's something too to someone. Ron said it, so now he's the head of it. <laughs> but no, that's a good idea. I would. Uh-huh. Yeah, I believe so. Do you, do you, do Ron, you know more on that too? Because you guys are, are you, what are you looking on as signups, right? Because Ron, you're one that you're overseeing some of the stuff, right? Yes, we are. Um, you and then and then you you're back there, right? Too okay, G Gerald. Okay, sorry, I was blinking, so that's why I kept saying Ron. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, as far as production goes, I know we talked about cans and different things, and we've been learning some different things, but I don't know if a, a setting like this would help if we went through the different ways of canning and we had people who knew how to can, or does it have to be in a, a hands on thing? Or can we keep it directed yeah. to? Yeah. So basically, I think what he's at, would you guys be, do you think, would people have interest in like someone teaching off from up here or something like that, Ron, just kind of that? Or would you guys rather have someone actually go and look out on the hands-on experience of it all? Um, you might have to have a hands-on, yeah. Which I mean, that could be something you guys could set up, you know, and like, Maybe one of the room. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what all it takes. Do you? Okay. I don't know much about canning. So. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and guys, there are still farms that do, I think it's Fortitude Farms and Autonomy Farm. There's farms that are doing exactly what I was doing um, and some other, you know, people that I knew that were in the same thing. If it was meat, if it was vegetables, we all were doing. It's the same concept across the board. If you're talking beef, chicken, or vegetables, we all kind of were doing the same idea, and that was direct selling and different things to consumers. Um, and so there are other places like that. And I can tell you, I bet they are beefing up because we, when, when we started our subscription plan, when COVID broke out, I was really nervous because obviously the, luckily we were about to land a big, um, a person that was gonna come down and buy our stuff and then sell it to a bunch of restaurants in LA. That got, didn't work out, which was probably good because the restaurant business went horrible for selling to them. But the subscription and the online store when COVID happened with the food, you know, people freaking out, we shot up. I had to cut it off because I, I um, my signups, I had to cut off the signups and be like, I don't know if I have enough. So it is guys. So, I mean, those people are gonna fill up too when these things hit because people are gonna run to all those type of things. So that may be something to look into as well. And I know that you guys are both working on it, like you just said. And um, so that's someone to look at too for, for chicken and all that. So with all that, I guess what we'll do is um, I'll, let's pray it out. And then um, I'll be here for a little bit if you guys wanna talk more. And then that way we can, Alfonso can stop recording and I'll let him go home. <laughs> so uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time to get together and, and fellowship. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to do this. It's been such a, it's been, you know, a little over a year now that I've even really even talked, got to really talk a bunch about farming, Lord. So I'm thankful for the opportunity, Father. Um, I pray that this was fruitful and that we can, they'll be able to take these principles and, uh, and apply it, Lord. And I just pray that for protection over us, for us to be bold and to be a light to this dark world, Lord, and to use us. Um, I pray that, you know, we were, Lord, we are trying to be wise and prepare for what's coming, but help us too, Lord, to spiritually prepare and submit to you in all the areas of our lives that we need to, Lord. And I just ask for wisdom and protection as we all go out through our week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.